Good morning and happy Valentine's Day, a day when we celebrate love. It's a bit of an odd holiday actually, the connection with love, or at least romantic love, probably came from the English 14th century writer Geoffrey Chaucer, who in his poem The Parliament of Fowls describes birds finding their mates on St Valentine's Day. But the real St Valentine, or, St. or Valentinus, lived in the 3rd century. Um, there are two almost identical stories about him, one set in Rome and one in Umbria in central Italy. Valentinus was either a priest or a bishop, and he was imprisoned for working with Christian communities during a time of intense Roman persecution. His jailer had either a blind daughter or a sick son, depending on which of the two stories you read, and he told Valentinus that if he healed his child, the jailer would himself convert to Christianity. Valentinus prayed for the child, the child was healed, and the jailer and his whole family converted and were baptised. The Roman Emperor Claudius Gothicus heard about this and was furious and had the whole family executed and Valentinus beheaded in the year 269 or 270 CE, or so the stories go. So this is actually not a very romantic tale. It probably doesn't get you wanting to rush out and buy cute little teddy bears and boxes of chocolates. Um, this is a very different kind of love. Valentinus' love for Jesus and uh, for the persecuted churches. Not a romantic, sentimental love, but a love that was very courageous in the face of persecution. And this kind of love um, is celebrated in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Paul and Silas, who were early church leaders, had established the church in Thessalonica in about the year 50 CE. And that predominantly Greek and Roman church community had very quickly experienced strong opposition, first from some people in the Jewish community and then from the city officials. Paul and Silas had to escape during the cover of night but the Jewish faction followed them to the next city and opposed them there too. So this was a time of great opposition, persecution even. Not the very brutal persecution of the Roman Empire that um, really started 20 or so years later and grew from there, but still the church at Thessalonica was suffering because of their decision to follow the way of Jesus. And Paul writes this tender letter to express his love and gratitude for them and to encourage them to not give up hope. This is our third and final week in the series, and we're going to look at the last couple of chapters of this letter today. You might remember that so far, Paul has told them they are models of faith, love, and hope. Like Jesus, they experience divine joy or joy in the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of their suffering. He's encouraged them to keep doing what they're doing, to keep loving one another and everyone else, and to do that more and more. And he's cautioned them against being seduced by their culture back into a different way of living, a more selfish, perhaps more hedonistic, less loving way of living. And then halfway through chapter four, there was something of a shift as Paul addresses an issue that is causing them a lot of anxiety. When Paul and Silas had been in Thessalonica, probably no more than a, um, a year earlier, um, they had taught this new church that Jesus would come back and they would all be with him. And this would be a time of vindication. They would know for sure, and the people around them would know, that they were right about Jesus being the Messiah and they were right to follow Jesus' way of love. Remember, neither Paul nor the Thessalonians had ever met Jesus during his lifetime. So this would be their chance. And it would be a time of great joy. This was something they were excited about and they were really looking forward to. But during the months between Paul's departure from Thessalonica and the writing of this letter, some members of the Thessalonian church had died. And so they wanted to know what would happen to them. Would they not get to meet Jesus now? Had they missed out on this reunion with Jesus? And so they're asking Paul, what happens to members of the church who die before Jesus comes? In addition, how many more will die before he comes? When is Jesus actually coming? Paul had taught them that they needed to be ready for Jesus' return. <clears throat> but how could they get ready when they didn't know when that would be? And finally, if Jesus, <coughs> sorry, and finally, if Jesus is not coming imminently as they had expected, what are the implications for how they should live? Questions like, when will Jesus come, might seem very theoretical or or just uh, theological speculation to us. But that is not where the Thessalonians are coming from with these questions. They weren't just wondering, hey Paul, you know, what's your take on these concepts that are out there? 
This was very real and immediate to them. People they loved were dying and Jesus hadn't returned. And they were confused. Um, they were experiencing very real doubt and anxiety. And so Paul's response is not primarily as a teacher or a prophet, laying out exactly what's gonna happen and when and how they can figure this all out. Rather, Paul responds as a pastor, as someone who loves them and wants to reassure them and encourage them not to give up hope. And I think that's an important distinction because we live in a very different context 2,000 years later. We're not living in expectation of Jesus's imminent return. Even if some of us choose to believe that Jesus is coming back soon, whatever soon is, none of us really live that way. We all plan for the future. We fully expect to live out our days. And at one level, we all know we'll die. At a very deep level, I think we all really struggle with that. But at least conceptually, we expect to die. So I don't think we are asking the same questions with the same level of anxiety that the Thessalonians were. Nevertheless, underlying these questions are things we very much still struggle with. I think questions that are very real for us that are not that dissimilar to what the Thessalonians were asking are, what does death really mean? How are we to think of it? What is going to happen in the future? Can we have hope for the future? And how can both of these, our view of death and our view of the future, how do those things impact how we live our lives now? These are big, weighty topics, and obviously we are not going to fully answer them this morning, not by any means. But let's see what Paul writes in this letter that might be helpful as we think about these things. Let's read from chapter four. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So Paul here starts with his rationale. He's writing to them so that they don't grieve like those who have no hope. Hope, as we've said previously, is a thread that ties this letter together. That's why we've called the series Hope Changes Everything. In chapter one, we saw that the Thessalonians hope in Jesus gave them endurance. It allowed them to continue in the way of love despite persecution and suffering. And here Paul's response to their question about what happens to those who've died is intended to give them hope. Now hope of course doesn't deny grief. Grief is very real, very normal. More than that, it's an essential part of being human. To lose someone we love is to lose a very part of ourselves. And adjusting to that loss can last the rest of our lives. It's painful, it's hard, grief is not just acceptable, it's necessary, it's good, it's, it's a reflection of our love. By contrast, high Roman culture of that time did deny grief, um, particularly for men. It was more acceptable for women to show grief, but men were expected to prioritize dignity and self-control. They were expected to be rational about the fact that people die, and to be fatalistic about uh, how and when that happens. Paul doesn't take that approach here. He doesn't in any way deny the importance of grief. But he says that in the midst of grief, we can have hope. Just as in the midst of suffering, they had found joy in the Holy Spirit, as we read in chapter one. And the reason Paul gives for this hope is that we believe Jesus died and rose again. This phrase, Jesus died and rose again, was almost certainly an early creed. The Greek is not Paul's style. Um, Paul generally writes Christ Jesus or our Lord Jesus Christ and says God raised him or he was raised rather than the active voice here of Jesus died and rose again. Paul says, you've been taught this creedal statement, this basic tenet of belief, Jesus died and rose again. And so building on that, we believe God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. For Paul, there is an intimate connection between believers and Christ Jesus. In Paul's later writings, he develops more fully the idea that believers are in Christ. But even in this first letter, he repeatedly says, we are in Christ, we are with Christ, we imitate Christ. Jesus Christ is our pattern. Um, we saw in chapter one, Paul wrote that the Thessalonians joy in the midst of suffering was an imitation of Christ. It followed the example of Jesus himself. In chapter two, Paul says it's not just the joy in suffering, but experiencing persecution is imitation of Christ. And here in chapter four, we see 
that even in death, the believer remains in Christ. Paul here uh, calls death sleep, which was uh, a very common euphemism. But those who have died have fallen asleep in Jesus. And so because we are in Christ, because there is such an intimate, unbreakable bond between us and Christ, since Jesus was raised, we will be raised. And when Jesus appears, we will appear. Death cannot break our connection with Jesus. Nothing can. Paul continues. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is a hard passage to understand. This is talking about something that is completely outside of our experience and something that was outside the experience of the Thessalonians and of Paul himself. Paul, of course, has never experienced Jesus' return. He's describing something that we don't really have words for because it's not part of our lived experience. So Paul draws on lots of imagery, much of which as uh, 21st century Americans we're not so familiar with. So this is a hard passage to understand. At the same time, many weighty tomes have been written on this and similar passages. Whole church denominations have been formed around what Jesus' return means. People have stored up supplies, they've separated themselves off from the rest of society. They've even committed mass suicide because of what they believe is going to happen when Jesus comes back. So let's try and unpack this a little but with a whole lot of humility. Uh, recognizing that we don't have all the answers, or at least I know I don't. So Paul had taught the Thessalonians that Jesus was coming back. Why would he say that? Well, first, because we read that Jesus said that. Uh, in John chapter 14, Jesus has just celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples on the night of his arrest, and he tells them he's going away. And then he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I, have not, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. So in this passage, there's very much a sense of comfort and hope in Jesus' return to them. They'll be reunited with Jesus. So they don't need to be anxious and upset. They don't need their hearts to be troubled. The disciples also heard about Jesus coming back from men in white. Uh, we assume they're angels, or that that's not explicitly stated. Um, by this time, Jesus has risen from the dead and made multiple appearances to groups of followers. And we believe we read in um, Acts chapter one this. Then they gathered around him and asked him, "Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel?" Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Both Acts and the Gospel of John were written quite a bit later than this letter to the Thessalonians. And of course, Paul wasn't there for either of these events. So this must have been part of the Christian tradition that was taught to Paul. But this is not described in terms of the second coming as we might think of it today. This seems to be a rather simple, comforting hope that Jesus will come back to his disciples pretty much as he's gone. He'll come to them, comfort them, and take them to be with him. When Paul is writing here to the Thessalonians, it's still another um, 40 to 50 years before Revelation is written. So Paul is not thinking in terms of charts of the end times. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like this, where people try and plot out all that's going to happen before and after Jesus comes back, and even calculate the dates. 
Um, this is uh, quite a famous one of these charts by the Reverend William Miller, who confidently predicted the end of the world would be in 1843, quoting, amongst other things, this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4. And there are modern books and charts that similarly plot it all out. Um, one I saw online included 9-11 as the sixth bowl of Revelation. Uh, another had COVID as one of the seven plagues. People are still busy trying to figure this all out. And I'm not raising these predictions to mock the people who are putting them together. I'm sure they are probably sincere people who just want to know, but they are clearly being disobedient. Jesus, as we read in Acts, said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates. And in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says, even I don't know the times or the dates, only the Father knows. So we can be very sure that Paul is in no way trying to help the Thessalonians put together a chart or figure it all out in that kind of a way here. That's not the intention. Paul says he wants to encourage them and give them hope, not satisfy their curiosity. As we've seen from John and Acts, the disciples' hope for Jesus' return seems to be pretty uh, simple, pretty personal. They want their friend back. They want, want to be with him, uh, to be comforted by him. But we also see overlaid onto that rather personal, intimate hope, the Jewish hope for the day of the Lord. In the Jewish scriptures, there are two phases to history. There's this present age and there's the age to come. And the day of the Lord is the event that brings an end to this present age and launches the age to come. And on that day, God steps in and vindicates the Jewish people and the Jewish faith, restores justice and brings an end to all forms of oppression and scarcity. Books like Daniel in what our Bible refers to as the Old Testament, as well as books like 4th Ezra and 1st Enoch that are part of what we call the Apocrypha. Um, that's Jewish writings from between about 200 BCE and 400 CE, as well as the Dead Sea Scrolls. They all use similar imagery in describing this day of the Lord. And that imagery includes trumpets that summon all people together, angels and archangels descending from heaven, and clouds symbolizing the power and presence of God, and so on. And of course, we see that same imagery here in 1 Thessalonians. In addition, though, we see imagery from the Roman Empire. Remember, Thessalonica is an important Roman city. So they would be more familiar with imperial imagery than they would with Jewish apocryphal imagery. The word used in 1 Thessalonians for Jesus' coming is parousia. The word means uh, presence or appearing, but it was most typically used of an emperor or other powerful leader coming. Um, this was a word that was used for a state visit. And Paul and Silas, when they were in Thessalonica, had apparently compared Jesus to the emperor, or at least they were accused of that. We read in Acts 17, the Jewish faction says of the Thessalonian believers, they are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. This passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 also uses the Greek technical term, a pantasis, meaning to meet, where it says we will meet the Lord in the air. A pantasis specifically meant going to greet a state dignitary, either the emperor or his representative. And the protocol for such a meeting was that as the dignitary approached, citizens would go out of the city to meet the person on the road, welcome them and escort them back to the city. And so Paul picks up on that metaphor here. He says, Jesus promised to come back to us and Jesus is our true king. So all of us, those who have died and those of us who are still alive, we will all go out to meet him and welcome him as our true king. So don't worry about those who have died don't worry that they've missed out on meeting Jesus. We will all meet him, we'll all greet him together as our king. So we have imagery from multiple sources used here to paint a picture. Personally, and this is just my personal opinion, I don't think it is meant to be taken literally. I don't think it's even really possible to reconcile the different types of imagery that are used. The men in white in Acts 1 said that Jesus would return the same way he left. But Jesus also said that the coming of the Son of Man would not be a localized event. No one would be able to say there he is or here he is, but rather it would be like lightning across the sky. Similarly, Paul says the dead will be raised, but elsewhere he says we'll all be changed, we'll be transformed. 
So it seems it's not this actual physical body that he seems to be referring to. In all of this, Paul is drawing on different imagery to try and describe something that is beyond our experience. And I don't think Paul had it all worked out either. I think we see in this area, as well as in many other areas, theology is being worked out. Followers of Jesus are trying to think through what does all this mean? How does what we've heard and seen and been taught all fit together and play out in our daily lives? This is theology under development, as it were. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says that those who have died will be raised when Jesus comes and will then be with Jesus. In later letters, Paul says those who have died are already with Jesus. I think it's probable that they didn't originally have this all thought through because they expected Jesus' return to be imminent. And I'm not in any way trying to say some of the scriptures are wrong or they're not inspired, but simply that these issues took time to work through, to wrestle with and pray over and discuss and to come to agreement on. So again, just my opinion, but I don't think we can take passages like this one and come up with a neat plan and timeline. Um, I saw this notice for an upcoming series on the church website recently. Uh, the title of the series is One Minute After You Die, and the church promises, bring your questions and find out what happens one minute after you die. Um, this is ex either extremely confident or possibly rather threatening. I'm, I'm not totally sure which. But the point of all this is that this passage is not a description of everything that's going to happen but is reassurance and encouragement to a new church that is struggling with anxiety and grief. Paul says, those alive will not precede those asleep. In other words, those who've died will not miss out on meeting Jesus. Don't worry about that. Loss is real. It's appropriate and it's right to grieve, but also have hope because death is not the end. Union with Jesus is the end. We are bound together with Christ Jesus. We are in Christ and nothing, not even death, can break that bond. In the midst of grief, we don't need a schematic. We don't need a play-by-play -play of what's going to happen. We need hope and our hope is in Jesus. Do Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had the very unenviable job of having to speak at the funeral of the four young girls killed by the racist bombing of a church in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. And he said this, I hope you can find some consolation from Christianity's affirmation that death is not the end. Death is not a period that ends the great sentence of life, but a comma that punctuates it to more lofty significance. Death is not a blind alley that leads the human race into a state of nothingness, but an open door which leads man into life eternal. Let this daring faith, this great invincible surmise be your sustaining power during these trying days. Someone else put it this way, when faced with the grief of losing someone we love, we put aside our sophistication and skepticism and shout into the pit of death, you will not have the last word. This life and all life belongs to God. Let's read on. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So to their second question, when will Jesus come? Paul says, we don't need to tell you. He reminds them of what he's presumably told them previously. We don't know when Jesus will come, but we do know it will be unexpected. It will be like a thief in the night. Those were Jesus' words um, in Matthew 24. The Son of Man would come like a thief in the night when you least expect it, when you wish you'd been prepared. People will be saying peace and security. That, of course, was the promise of Rome. Rome's military power was supposed to keep people safe and bring them peace. But when you least expect it, that old world order will be destroyed. Or like labor pains, a sudden and inescapable pain that is part of the process of new life coming into existence. Again, as so often with Paul, we have a number of different metaphors here, layers of imagery, all of which say we don't know when, but we need to be ready. 
But that, of course, leads to the third question. If we don't know when, how can we get ready? Do we live each day like it's our last? Have you seen that slogan? I'm sure you have. I think it's meant to be motivational. Maybe it's, it's helpful some, for some people. I don't find it too helpful, though. I, I mean, um, I get what it's trying to say, but if I woke up each morning honestly thinking it was my last day, I would be a hysterical mess. I mean, my poor family would just get smothered with all the love and words of wisdom that I'd uh, planned on giving them for the next few decades. And I wouldn't be able to enjoy anything. You know, um, I'd, I'd stroke my cat and burst into tears thinking it's the last time I'll ever be able to do this. I'd be a wreck. And then there's all the practical stuff. I honestly don't need much of an excuse not to do the laundry. If I thought it was my last day, I'm not spending it doing laundry, I can tell you that. And it seems that perhaps some of the Thessalonians had similarly thought, what's the point in working if Jesus is coming back any day now? Uh, there's some references to the need to work that, that maybe suggest that they thought, you know, why plant crops? Uh, why embark on a building project? Why, why go out and work? You're not going to enjoy the benefit. What's the point? So what does it mean to be ready for Jesus? Again, Paul seeks to reassure them. He writes, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. So at the heart of this, Paul is saying, you don't need to be afraid. You are ready. Just stay ready. You are already living in the light. Just keep doing that and do it more and more. Live lives characterized by faith, hope and love as you are already doing. Live good, healthy, loving lives and live hopefully because you've got nothing to fear. You are bound together with Jesus. Jesus rescues us from wrath and we will all live together with him. We looked briefly at the idea of wrath two weeks ago. Um, you might remember we said it's not a word that refers to uh, explosive, impulsive anger that comes out of nowhere. Rather, it is God's settled opposition to injustice. It's about bringing an end to oppression, casting down the mighty and lifting up the humble, setting things to rights. And this wrath of God that carries with it a sense of judgment and justice is an intrinsic part of the day of the Lord. So what exactly does that wrath look like? How will it be accomplished? How will God bring an end to all oppression? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know what wrath looks like in a God who is love. Not just a God who is loving, but a God who is love. I was raised to believe that wrath looks like eternal damnation, but I find that hard to reconcile with the fact that God is love. I find it impossible, in fact. If we know anything about love, divine love, and I think we do looking at Jesus, then concepts like eternal damnation don't seem to work, at least they don't for me. But then what is wrath? How can justice and mercy be reconciled? Again, I think many of us struggle with this. I, I know I certainly do. For there to be justice and to be mercy, what would that mean for someone like Hitler? What punishment would achieve justice for what he did? At the other end of the equation, I have huge admiration for the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in post-apartheid South Africa. What a beautiful attempt to marry justice and mercy. But if my husband or my child was killed by someone who was then granted an amnesty, I don't think I could be okay with that. Again, I'm just speaking for myself. Some people seem confident of how this will all be worked out, and, and I respect that. But for, personally, for me, my mind can't figure out just how justice and mercy can truly come together or what wrath looks like in the context of grace. Grace, that concept that Paul loves so much, a word that is used more than a hundred times in letters ascribed to him. Grace, favor or kindness that can only be given and never earned. 
grace that begins and ends this letter to the Thessalonians. And then in the middle of this letter, we have the concept of wrath. How do they fit together? I don't know. And certainly Paul doesn't try and explain it here. He doesn't seem interested in what will happen to whom. This is not that kind of a letter. He is writing to reassure anxious and grieving believers. And his response is, you don't need to be anxious for the future. Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep going in the way of love. And nothing, not even death, can separate you from Jesus. The idea of Jesus coming back looks very different for us 2,000 years later. We have a very different perspective. Our culture still has a fascination with how will it all end. Uh, there's so many movies and series and books and so on, um, secular as well as religious, that speculate about the end of the world, um, whether that's through nuclear annihilation or uh, a takeover by uh, artificial intelligence or global climate change or even a more deadly virus. Um, who knows? And all of that can seem very dark and frightening. It can look like night. It can look like there's no room for hope. And maybe our response is to get depressed or fatalistic. And what can you do? Or maybe it's just to forget it all and live for the moment. If so, maybe we can lean into Paul's message of reassurance and hope for the future. Paul says it looks like night, but it's actually day. You are awake before the full sunrise. Stay awake and see the full day. God has hope for our world. All is not lost. Don't be anxious. Keep doing what you're doing. Live with an active faith, a hardworking love, which includes working to make the world a better place, an enduring hope that nothing, not even death, can ever separate us from Jesus. Paul closes this section with these words. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Let's share hope with one another. Let's encourage one another. Let's keep doing what we're already doing, being there for one another in our grief and our suffering, our doubt or anxiety. None of us have it all worked out. But our hope is not in explanations. Our hope is in Jesus. We're going to take communion together in a moment, a ritual that celebrates this bond we have with Jesus, a bond that nothing can break, not even death itself. But first, let's pray together. Dear God, sometimes we catch a glimpse of how small and finite we are, how little we understand, how far we are from having it all worked out. But we know you are love. We know we belong to you. We know we are one with you, even if we don't really know what that means. And so we give you all our questions and confusion, our doubts, our anxieties, and we trust in your goodness and your love. Fill us with hope, hope in knowing that you are always with us and nothing can separate us from your love. 